Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Tariq Al Sayed, and I'm a pediatric cardiologist here in Pittsburgh. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Anita Saraf. I'm an adult congenital cardiologist here at University of Pittsburgh as well. All right. I want to welcome you today to the first Fontaine Kreutzer Conference uh, held here at the prestigious University of Pittsburgh Club. Um, I'm delighted to see many esteemed um, colleagues, eminent surgeons, um, esteemed academicians, dedicated healthcare professionals, and passionate medical students today gathering for this milestone event. Just as the world eagerly watched the climatic France-Argentina football finals or soccer finals, uh, we convene today to celebrate two pioneering surgeons from these very nations who crafted this life-saving procedure. Dr. Guillermo Kreutzer of Argentina. Uh, welcome, Dr. Kreutzer. And uh, Dr. Francis Fontaine of France, much like the final contenders of the world's most loved game, uh, brought together a unity of purpose, skill, and dedication in the face of adversity. These two visionaries, driven by their commitment to saving lives, developed the Fontaine Kreutzer procedure, which is a game changer procedure in the world of cardiac medicine. Their groundbreaking work has given countless children born with single ventricle congenital heart disease a chance to lead healthier and fuller lives. Much like in football, where each pass, each strategy, and each uh, goal brings the team closer to victory, in the realm of medicine, each discovery, each invention, and each innovative procedure brings us closer to our goal to improve human lives. Just as France and Argentina displayed unity within their uh, teams on the field, we as members of the global medical community demonstrate unity in our pursuit of progress, innovation, and betterment of humanity. As we move forward into this exciting conference, let us remember the unity and collaboration that the Fontaine Kreutzer procedure represents. Today, let us strive to work together, learn from each other, and unite our efforts to better serve humanity. Enjoy conference, make the most of the insights and experiences shared, and remember we are all players on the same team with a common goal of saving lives and improving the quality of life of patients with single ventricle. Together we are more powerful than we could ever be alone. Thank you and let's have a fruitful and successful conference. Thank you, Tarek. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Jacqueline Kreutzer as our keynote speaker at the inaugural Fontaine Kreutzer Symposium here in Pittsburgh. Um, Dr. Kreutzer is the professor of pediatrics and the division chief for cardiology at the UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. She holds the Peter and Ada Rosen Endowed Chair in Pediatric Cardiology and has over 20 years of clinical experience in congenital catheter interventions and has directed the cardiac catheterization lab for over 15 years. In 2017, she was appointed the division chief and the co-director of the Heart Institute. Under her leadership and in close collaboration with CT surgery, CICU, and cardiac anesthesia, she has helped move this program forward, which is now recognized as one of the top programs in the country, according to the US News and World Report. The main areas of her academic interest include novel interventional therapies, transcatheter management of peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis, including those associated with aortopathies, cardiac catheterization outcomes research and quality improvement, as well as transcatheter valve therapies. She's board certified in pediatric cardiology and adult congenital heart disease. She has ex extensively lectured nationally and internationally and has authored over 100 publications and has a long history of commitment to teaching and mentoring students, residents, fellows, and colleagues, including myself, from the US and abroad. She has also served and continues to serve many academic committees, including the American Board of Pediatric Board Pediatrics, Board of Pediatric Cardiology, American Heart Association, NCDR, SCAI, amongst many others, and as well as uh, served as on, on editorial positions in many journals, including Jack. Please welcome Dr. Kreutzer for her keynote presentation. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Anita. That was very generous. It's such an honor and a pleasure and welcome you all uh, to this special conference that we're hosting today. Um, so it's been now 50 years since the inception of the Fontan uh, Kreutzer procedure, and there has been a remarkable evolution in the understanding of the circulation, in the changes in the surgical as uh, and well as medical management strategies that I will try to um, go over today. So we'll review um, the historical evolution of the fontan kreutzer procedure, different eras in the understanding, lessons learned over time, and then also look a little bit about uh, evolving strategies to adjust, address the challenges. So we're going really, really early. When was the first time we started challenging the need for a pump, for a pulmonary pump? Uh, because in the past, you know, the circulation, you need a pulmonary pump to push blood through the lungs. So the first three times this was challenged was with, in the, in the mid-50s. Dog experiments by Rothbard, anastomosing the right atrial appendage to the pulmonary artery. And then the first true cable pulmonary shunt was done by uh, Carlo Carlon in Italy in 1950. So there's a picture of what he did, essentially anastomose the acidus vein to the right pulmonary artery, ligating the right pulmonary artery on the other side, and ligating the superior vena cava, creating a direct cable pulmonary you know, anastomosis with uh, bypassing the right, partial bypass of the right heart. And then Glenn used those same um, Carlos uh, technique in dogs first. And then there were other surgeons in Budapest, in Russia, among other sites, and the first patient, that was Shoemaker, end-to-end -end anastomosis into patients that they died. Actually, it was one of them had trunkers with pulmonary hypertension, so not, not a very good candidate. Uh, but then Glenn was the first one who do, do Dr. Glenn. There's a picture of him there. A successful atrial pulmonary shunt in a, not atrial pulmonary shunt, a, a cable pulmonary shunt in a seven-year-old with tri um, transposition of the great vessels. And there's the technique he used. You can see there how it's a end to side anastomosis of the superior vena cava to the right pulmonary artery and ligation of the uh, right, uh, the, the SVC to the right edge uh, connection. And then the bidirectional Dr. Dogliotti in Italy, in, in Turin, left open the connection so there would be bidirectional flow into both. So that was the first uh, published in 1961. So these were concepts of partial. You can partially bypass the right heart. Total right heart bypass, then we have to talk about Francis Fontan and, um, and Billy Kreutzer in Argentina. So um, Francis Fontan had done, done ex dog experiments, anastomosing the right atrial appendage to the pulmonary artery with a homograph with a valve in the IVC, but the dogs would not survive. And he thought that the reason was that their right atrium was normal, as opposed to tricuspid atresia, where the idea was, uh, in, by, in Francis Fontan's original work, is that the right atrium is thickened and it could potentially create, be working as a pump. So in the original study in 71, uh, published in 71, that was the concept, the right atrium working as a pump. And independent of this work in Argentina, uh, the, the, uh, the total, cable, uh, total bypass of the right heart was done uh, by Billy Kreutzer. So if we look at the original uh, Fontan uh, paper, you can see that there is the concept, the idea that they thought it was indispensable to put valves. So he anastomosed the right atrial appendage to the pulmonary artery with a homograph, with a valve homograph, and then put a valve in the IVC, did a direct gland on the right side, and the idea was that the right atrium would work as a pump. Um, and two of those procedures were, um, those were two, the two successes. It's interesting when you read this paper, you find a few, like the early thoughts uh, of this circulation. Um, you can see he, they wrote, respiratory assistance should be stopped early because positive pressure prevents central venous return. Like really, really early. Another less explicable feature of the postoperative course was that in both cases, a right or bilateral pleural effusion happened. <laughs> this is not surprising. And then uh, other elements remain unpredictable. Look at this the hemodynamic consequence of an eventual atrial rhythm disturbance, such as atrial fibrillation or flutter. He put it already in there. Some of the issues that we later on um, you know, had to deal with, clearly. Um, 
Billy Crozer in Argentina in July of 1971, they had a, a very sick three-year-old that came emergently with severe cyanosis with acute decompensation, tricuspid atresia type 1B with normally related great arteries. Uh, the Waterstone shunt had occluded and the right pulmonary artery had occluded. Very, very cyanotic. And in those times, there were not a lot of options because doing a left BTT shunt um, would have mean you had to clamp the LPA and you had no flow to the RPA, so it would have been not possible. And the idea of doing that on bypass was not, had not been described. So um, the mother begged uh, Billy to do something for her dying child. And he said, well, I have an idea, uh, but it's never been, I have never done it before. This is very experimental. And I uh, asked her per permission and she consented for that. And he performed the tripulmary anastomosis and endocardiopulmary bypass. Um, and, um, connected the rightish appendage to the, uh, with a homograph to the left pulmonary artery, did not do a gland, but left a fenestration. So he left a six millimeter opening that allowed for right to left shunting and did not put uh, uh, any valves in the IVC because the, in, in, the, in the mind of the team at the time was the idea was you needed a pathway to the pulmonary artery with a fenestration. So that was, that was the, first, the first fenestration. Um, in, the, in the second patient, they did directly harvested the pulmonary artery, which was normal and connected to the right atrial appendage. Um, so that was presented in the Society of uh, Cardiology in Argentina in 1971 in their conference as an operation for correction of tricuspid atresia. And then it was published in JTCBS in 1973 uh, with a series of patients. So that's, um, let's see, I lost my arrow. Um, the idea here was that the right atrium is not a pump. So that was the controversy that uh, continued over the next, you know, probably 10 years or so. There was a discussion. Right atrium being a pump for Fontan, and then uh, the Argentina, uh, France versus Argentina, <laughs> the, the idea is what the right atrium is, it's a pathway, it's not a pump. Um, and, uh, and then they perfected the technique because one of the problems with the right atrial pulmonary anastomosis was that it was anterior, get compressed by the sternum, so obviously that would be causing trouble. And so uh, the, the idea, the next uh, uh, innovation was to do a posterior atrial pulmonary anastomosis. Um, you can see here in this very old slide from the uh, group in Buenos Aires, um, where um, from the like our very early 80s, late 70s, it really had understanding of the of a Fontan circulation. You can see how you need a wide open uh, pathway. They had the resistance of the vascular bed, and then that the suction to the whole system was the left ventricular and diastolic pressure. So that the circulation, the concept of the circulation, was based on that gradient between the right atrium and the left atrium. So the next era was when the atropulmary anastomosis became essentially widespread, uh, uh, used uh, all over the world. Uh, and then soon, because of the distensibility of the right atrium, the high, the venous compliance, the high pressures of the venous system, and the consequences of comp uh, compression on the pulmonary veins, the scar tissue formation and uh, incidence of arrhythmias, uh, you know, th those were all the, the problems that started to be identified in these patients that led to really the need to develop new, te new technologies. Around that time, Dr. Kawashima introduced a total cable pulmonary connection um, from the SVC to the pulmonary arteries in patients with interrupted IVC. There it was almost total because the hepatic veins were still going to the heart. But in, in, in that paper, he says, this is a proof that you don't need a pump, uh, you know, because this functions well and you don't have a pump, obviously, it's direct SVC with, with the IVC flow. But you can also say by the fact that he wrote that there is that there was still controversy about the right atrium needing to actually do a kick, have a kick function. And then the third era uh, is when you know, new pathways were identified that were more energy efficient. And that was very much thanks to Mark de Leval's studies on the energy efficiency of the Fontan circuit and how um, the, the, you know, they uh, proposed the lateral tunnel, the total cable pulmonary connection. It's interesting that Francisco Puga had already uh, proposed in 1987, had already performed an extracardiac conduit. 
as, a, as an option for patients where you could not do an atropulmonary anastomosis, especially if you have heterotaxy or if you have complex forms of single ventricle with atresia one of, or, or common AV valves. So, um, and, friends, and, and that's in the area of the, of the total cable pulmonary shunt with Marc de Leval that then got perfected by you know, other surgeons. Aldo Castañeda proposed some changes to facilitate, to uh, augment, improve the geometry of the patches of the lateral tunnel. Uh, and then the um, you know, very, very uh, important introduction of the, of the fenestration, which had been already done by Billy in the original paper in 71, but the routine use of a fenestration as a punch within that uh, uh, right, uh, lateral tunnel baffle uh, with um, closure of a fenestration in the postoperative period or later on. And that was introduced by the Boston team uh, with Castaneda, Locke, and Nancy Bridges. So um, soon it was learned that the lateral tunnel, although seemed wonderful in the beginning, you didn't have the right atrial dilation and all that, you still had significant suture lines, very, very similar to the suture lines that you see in a master procedure. So arrhythmia started to happen, and the lateral tunnel does, can dilate, and you can get into atrial buffer leaks. So um, it, it became clear that improved options were necessary. Uh, and you can see that Dr. Carlo Marcelletti in Bambino, in Hospital Bambino Gesù in, it, in Italy in 1990 introduces the extracardiac conduit. Uh, and that ended up being prefer the preferred you know, surgical procedure, became pre preferred procedure of choice, which is what we do now. Uh, there's many studies that follow, including this one here from Lardo and Del Nido, showing the energy efficiency of the extracardiac condom being superior to that of the lateral tunnel, uh, and especially if there is some offset where the IVC enters to where the SVC enters, so there's no the crushing of the two uh, flows. Sorry. So um, when we look uh, at the, when we think about the evolution of the understanding of the intricacies of the Fontaine Kreuzer circulation, uh, we have to, um, there are lessons learned in every, in every uh, of these subjects, the physiology, the pathways, we have to think about the lungs, the ventricle, and then finally, last but not least, the lymphatics, which clearly um, we have discovered play a key role. The understanding of the physiology, if you look back at the early slide from Buenos Aires, um, you know, this is a, they're not that dissimilar to a current slide uh, from Mark Gulling in, 19, in uh, 2017. But you can see this beautiful representation in his work uh, um, from Belgium uh, showing the venous return directly connected to the uh, pulmonary capillary bed, the fenestration bypassing the lungs, and then the uh, arterial uh, return to, uh, through the systemic capillary bed and then back. And then down there are a graph showing the pressure changes from the systemic venous pressure, the, the pulmonary arteries, and then as you come down to the, um, to the ventricle, to the diastolic pressure. And some more concepts that I think help in the understanding of Fontaine physiology by Mark Gulli is this really nice graph that tells you in the paler tones that would be like an ideal Fontaine uh, the, 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 this is the pressure and the y-axis, and you can see it's the, stol the systemic um, uh, and systole, the high pressure, arterial, and then how it drops through the um, uh, systemic capillary bed, the systemic venous return, pulmonary vascular resistance, and then down further to the ventricular and diastolic pressure. And how the Fontan starts to fail, what you see is that the PBR tends to squeeze a little bit, the end diastolic pressure goes up, uh, and that also has a secondary effect on cardiac uh, output. So um, this is a nice hourglass that shows, uh, you know, in, in really a concept that in the Fontan circulation, the true bottleneck is at the level of the, pulmonary, of the lungs, of the pulmonary vascular resistance. And because of that, uh, as the pulmonary vascular resistance increases, you have a secondary effect on decreasing the uh, preload and that has an impact on the ventricle. So in a normal heart, a stroke volume really depends, uh, you know, on the, it, it's not dependent on the pulmonary vascular resistance. Um, but we know stroke volume depends on the preload. In a, in a single ventricle, as the pulmonary vascular resistance increases, uh, you will see that the preload will decrease and that will have an impact in cardiac output. So there is a really, uh, we have, it's very, very different physiology that we have to understand and Mark Gulick had significant contributions in that regard. 
we have learned a lot of things about the pathways. When the pathways, the new models came out, now we knew if they didn't work well, we could convert them, and you can convert them by surgery. It wasn't just the plumbing that matter. We learned that you have to also do uh, uh, address the arrhythmia surgery um, for that to succeed. We also learned that these conduits don't seem to be good forever, that they tend to, uh, the cross-sectional area narrows over time, uh, and that they, that you know, needs to be addressed, as opposed to in the lateral tunnel, which is in this graph there in the red, that they tend to dilate, the conduits don't, and indeed, the cross-sectional area tends to decrease. We also have learned that um, the adverse energy um, energetics can be measured and quantified through 3D uh, flow data derived, derived from computational flow dynamics and 4D flow magnetic ingress resonance images. There's been great advancements in that that helps us understand the dynamics and hopefully help design optimal surgical pathways. We have learned that pulmonary artery stenosis is not good, that needs to be aggressively treated, uh, because any source of unnecessary uh, gradients need to be eliminated, even in small. And that the routine use of fenestration um, is uh, very helpful in the postoperative period and can have impact long term. Uh, and if the patient needs a fenestration, we can do it in the cath lab, we can create it, there are different techniques, we can improve that, we can perforate through Gore-Tex, uh, we can use the bobby to create holes, and there's lots of no, uh, ways of doing that. We have learned, we used to think, when I was a fellow, collaterals were really bad, we called them all then. Collaterals were, oh, we don't care anymore about collaterals, uh, we left them all open, and now we know that collaterals do matter. So we actually, because we know because we can actually measure them, thanks to MRI, we can quantify them, and the collateral burden is an issue, and we have a lot of techniques to, to close them uh, in the cath lab as well. With regards to the ventricle, yeah, obviously we have the systolic function, which we can address by echo and MRI, and we know that over time it tends to progressively decrease in patients with single ventricle. Uh, but the, the, the key um, feature in the circulation is really also the, the diastolic function, which can be a little harder, harder to diagnose. Uh, and diastolic dysfunction tends to be very prevalent as years go by. And the table here shows triggers to diastolic dysfunction and the level of evidence that support uh, in literature review. So there's lots and lots of triggers to diastolic dysfunctions in these patients that are very important to address. We have understood the evolution uh, of, a of a patient with single ventricle as they go from the volume loaded state uh, illustrating the pressure volume loop in green to go with Fontan circulation where they become a volume uh, uh, underloaded, underfilled, volume contracted condition. Uh, and so we ha have understanding and you can see how uh, over time as the end diastolic pressure increases, the curve, this is the red one, things get worse. With regards to the hemodynamics, we have learned that they do matter in the original Chosuas uh, Cartilla. Many of these are not applicable today. You can see, okay, arrhythmias, we have treatments, we have pacemakers and various things. Age, uh, there's a lot of these that are not, not really so valid, but the hemodynamic parameters continue to be. I mean, pressure of over 15, back, low back pulmonary vascular resistance, those continue to be key points. There's still controversy, however, on whether or not you need to do a cardiac catheterization in every patient prior to a Fontan procedure, although in Pittsburgh we do. Um, there, we know that clinical data, critical clinical data, can be found through cardiac cath, and that surveillance cath uh, after Fontan can be very, very helpful to address these problems. Um, and if the physiologic details that can be obtained on multiple and very, very important, we know that resting Fontan pressures do matter and that the higher pressures are associated with worse outcomes, and that the car low cardiac output obviously can have variable income, but the a PBR is very important to measure as we have therapies that can, uh, can improve them. We have learned, you know, the cath lab is truly a, an incredible physiologic uh, lab for these patients where we can change and test conditions. We can test the fenestration if they have one to see, you know, the health of the Fontan circulation to see whether they have or not been of collaterals. We can do pulmonary hypertension study to see the candidacy for phosphodiesterase inhibitors and therapy specifically for uh, PB, PBR. We can do a fluid challenge, and Brian Goldstein brought that to our institution as a routine use. Every Fontan patient, uh, we now do fluid challenge to look for occult uh, diastolic dysfunction. 
Um, and this you know, really has been very useful to understand what's going on, where the bottleneck is in these patients, and sometimes it's more of a ventricular problem, but sometimes it's more of a PBR problem. And we sometimes can do pacing and do strategies in patients who have uh, problems with AV, AV conduction. The PBR we know is key. The lungs over time uh, do um, change. Uh, and with, there are some pathologic evidence that there are histologic changes in patients with Fontan, that they do lose uh, some of the integrity of the media um, uh, at pulmonary artery level. And there is a progressive increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. With the lungs, we have also learned that you need hepatic factor. And although in the Fontan procedure, usually you do have hepatic factor, um, this um, typically, um, it can still happen if you have abnormal distribution of the hepatic factor. That can happen in heterotaxy. Pulmonary arterial malformations are obviously more common after Kawashima or a Glen, but they could happen in a Fontan, especially in patients with heterotaxy that may have uh, and, you know, abnormal connections or supportosystemic shunts. Now, they tend to go away when you do the Fontan and you bring the hepatic factor back, but there are some patients who may have portosystemic shunts, whether they are congenital and heterotaxy um, or, uh, or other, um, and those can be treated in the cath lab, they're a little hard to diagnose. You may have to balloon occlude the IVC and inject below to see the connection from the IVC flow into the portal system, balloon occlude it, and then close it, and then tend to go away. It is possible also to reroute the hepatic flow. We could do it surgically, but we can also do it in the cath lab, thanks to really uh, good cover stents that we have. Uh, and this is something that we can do, and this is just an example of a patient where we rerouted the hepatic flow using these gore cover stents, and this is a kid who was desaturating to the 60s, and then a year later on a follow-up cath, the arterial saturation was 92, after we redirected hepatic flow back to the uh, right lung, which was where the uh, AVMs were. Now, over time, we have learned that the lymphatic circulation plays a key role. Uh, it is profoundly affected by high venous pressures, and that's essential, the essence of the Fontan uh, Groyster circulation. So every Fontan has a some degree of dysfunction. Dr. Marlies Vite, who is a famous uh, lymphatic um, expert, uh, told my brother, Christian, your father devised the procedure as basically creating right heart failure. And you guys never thought before of the lymphatic circulation, you're just finding it now. He's like, how come? Um, and so you can see that the lymphatics, as opposed to in the normal heart, and the lymphatics are, are um, formed, uh, the lymphatic fluid is created at a, in a circuit that is at higher pressure than even the circuit where it's draining into. So um, it's um, because it's created in the lungs and then you can, it's, drain, it's supposed to drain at a higher pressure in the venous system. So it's a real, real conf problem with lymphatics. We have to recognize the incredible uh, job of Job Dory and the group in uh, CHOP uh, to really help us understand uh, lymphatic circulation and all the sources of dysfunction, which can explain almost every of uh, the um, known failures uh, of the circulation, including uh, plastic bronchitis and protein loosen enteropathy and effusions, and even may have an effect on lymphatics at the level of the heart uh, function. And as, as the pressures go up, and you can see the different sources of leaks and the beautiful graphs from the you have uh, uh, shared with me. So in terms of outcomes, you know, in the early, early publications in 1990, uh, when Fontan and Kirkland um, published the perfect Fontan uh, results, you can see that the hazard function, the instantaneous risk of death at each moment, um, uh, uh, after the operation, had a rapidly declining um, six, uh, the early six-month period uh, curve, and then stabilized, but then further continued attrition after six years. And they concluded that this was a very much a palliative procedure. Now, uh, outcomes have clearly changed over time. And although, if you look at the overall, and you take in, 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 in this experience of 40 years after the Fontan operation, over, over a thousand patients, uh, you can see that at 30 years, the survival was um, 43%. However, there's a huge error effect. So it's very different when you look at the uh, era after 20, 2001, where the survival at uh, 10 years is more than 90%. 
and further studies like a meta-analysis on Fontan outcome here, you can see that it's over 80% at 20 years. So things have changed, we have gone better over time. Large studies such as the Australian and New Zealand registry can show the survival at age 30, 90 and 80% at age 40 after, after Fontan procedure. So there's remarkable uh, improvement over the years in how these patients have done. Despite that we talk obviously a lot about their problems, but that's how, how we want to be coming with solutions to help them. So um, the evolution over time, you can see here from a, a paper from Boston and a paper from, from Job. In a perioperative survivors of Fontan surgery in the patient paper from Boston, gradual attrition occurs predominantly from thromboembolism, heart failure related, and sudden death. And you can see at 20 years um, being 82% survival. And in the CHOP experience with a lot of hypoplasts there, 74% at 20 years. So it is estimated that patients um, operated on today may leave, um, they may have a 30-year survival in the order of more than 80% in the current era. And there, that apparent, about over uh, 70,000 patients may be alive worldwide today with a um, Fontan Kreuzer procedure. Uh, and that this population is just expect, expected to expand over the next 20 years, so we need to get ready for taking care of all these patients. So while there are strategies, were truly there are lots of areas that we can focus in terms of strategies, medical strategies. Most therapies that we have for heart failure, for addressing the different uh, um, areas, whether you're talking about the pulmonary vascular resistance, the systemic uh, ventricular function, atrial arrhythmias, a lot of these therapies are extrapolated from other diseases. So studies that are focused on Fontan circulation are going to be essential. Uh, assure that the strategic planning, planning from the whole course of the, of the child's um, life is thought to preserve PBR and ventricular function. And important active surveillance, protocolized care to make sure that we address um, potential therapeutic targets early in time. We may try to decrease the population of Fontan patients by improving the surgical techniques on every patient that has, you know, is a candidate for a biventricular repair can have one. Multidisciplinary uh, single ventricle programs and collaborative research such as the Fontan network, force, and others that truly help us understand at, at a collaborative manner, increasing the number of patients, how to care of these patients um, nas at national and, and international level. Lymphatic directed therapies will be critical on how to decompress the lymphatics or medications that actually treat lymphatic dysfunction, which we don't, we don't have any. And a Fontan pump, that has been brought up by many uh, as a potential solution in the future. So in conclusion, the fontan kreutzer procedure was, was a paradigm-shifting paradigm advancement in the care of patients born with single ventricle. Challenges remain major. Novel specific therapies and approaches are really needed to tackle the many intricacies of this circulation. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and I end with a Dali painting that shows you how you need to have an open mind uh, when you're analyze, analyzing a really complex scenario like the Fontan uh, Kreutzer uh, circulation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kreutzer, for an amazing talk. Um, we will now take questions from our online audience as well as the audience present here. Um, if you could either raise your hand and then, um, or post on to the uh, Zoom link that you have, uh, we will um, get your question and um, ask them here. I know there's another opportunity for questions later on too, so, and I'm here, so we can always uh, uh, do that later. Sure, no let's see if there's anything coming up. There's a question there. Why did Kreutzer refuse to sew in valves at the level of the IVC? Why did you refuse to do that? <laughs> I, think, uh, I think the answer was because he didn't think it was necessary, right? Because he didn't think the right atrium was a pump. 
Ja. No, you can say so, as it was in the remote. Well, uh, a long time ago, Dr. Luis Becu, our pathologist in the children's hospital, told me, Billy, when, when I show him the Fontan paper, the original Fontan paper, he told me, Billy, the right intro will never function as a pump. This is wrong. Number four. Anyway. Hmm? All right. Thank you, Dr. Kreutzer. Um, I would now like to invite Dr. Victor Morel.